very, very dangerous procedure. We have abnormalities all the time. We have natural miscarriages and we have uh, three to four percent of actual children that are born who have genetic abnormalities of one sort or another. We can't ask for absolute safety with cloning, but we can ask for a level of safety that is similar to those with other reproductive procedures. Within a few seconds of birth, there was a huge, loud howl from Louise, and the baby here arrived. 23 years ago, a healthy baby girl called Louise overturned people's fears about interfering with reproduction. Louise was the first test tube baby, made by bringing sperm and egg together in a dish. Today, IVF is routine, and doctors Zavos and Antonori claim that cloning will be just as safe. Whatever the consequences are, you will go ahead with it. There are not going to be any consequences. We think that we can, we can hit as high as uh, uh, IVF uh, success which is about 30% in the US right now. But over the past decade, a new form of IVF has emerged, which is far more invasive. In a technique called ICSI, weak sperm, which could not penetrate an egg naturally, are injected with a needle. Until human cloning is attempted, ICSI is the only model we have to judge how human cells will stand up to the kinds of manipulations which cloning will involve. Although ICSI has produced thousands of healthy babies, a small number of scientists have begun to report problems. Several have linked ICSI to a higher risk of abnormalities. Some of the problems are likely to be inherited from the faulty sperm. But does the technique itself, which involves injecting DNA into the heart of an egg, cause problems? In the US, one team decided to compare what happened to sperm and egg during the first few hours after normal fertilization and after ICSI. They saw some worrying differences. These are human sperm prior to fertilization and you can see that they have this necktie-like structure around the equator of the sperm chromosomes. The chromosomes are in blue. During fertilization naturally, this necktie would be lost at the surface of the egg. But in contrast, after ICSI, here is a sperm in the egg. And you can see that the red collar persists and that the sperm is not inflating uniformly as a round balloon, but instead is constricted by that necktie. In nature, a sperm's DNA would swell uniformly, ready to combine with an egg's DNA. But after ICSI, they found the sperm's packaging got in the way, and the vital sex chromosome became trapped. The implications for cloning are serious because instead of injecting a sperm, they'll use the nucleus of a completely different kind of cell that was never designed to meet an egg. So the potential for this kind of error is much greater. Contrast that with cloning an animal like Dolly. Well, first, the mother's chromosomes are removed. We don't know what else is removed when the mother's chromosomes are removed. We don't wake the egg up by having a sperm wake the egg up. Frequently, we use an electric zap. I mean, is, is electrocution the best way to start off in life? It certainly isn't the method that's mirrored naturally. But still, Dr. Zavos and Antonori claim they're on the brink of the experiment that will alter the course of human evolution. Of course we're going to go ahead with it, no matter what. The infertility couples are the ones that make those decisions, not us, not them, nobody else. We are considering 200 couples. That doesn't mean that 200 couples will be cloned immediately. 
We will start with the first one and we'll finish with the 200th one. So could they actually succeed? Until they try, it's impossible to tell. But other scientists have already tried to clone our close relatives, rhesus monkeys. So far, from more than a thousand attempts to clone a monkey from an adult cell, not a single one has succeeded. The DNA has so fragmented that no cloned embryo has yet survived. But some believe it's only a matter of time before these hurdles are overcome, and that progress towards human cloning is inevitable. First, there will be a refinement of the technologies that are being applied to sheep and cattle and mice. There will be clonings that occur in dogs and cats, and they will be reliable enough that actually people will be interested in cloning their own pets. There will be clonings that occur in rhesus monkeys that will demonstrate these procedures are feasible in primates. And at that point, the risks will be sufficiently reduced that some group like the Zavoses and Antonores of the world will leap in and attempt and actually succeed at doing a human cloning. And as the drive towards cloning continues, more and more people are drawn to seek this new way to change their lives. I think I would say, uh, <laughs> walk in our shoes. <laughs> For one week, walk in our shoes and then, and then judge. You know, be, be in our situation and then judge us. And I can guarantee you they will have a different judgment. The reason why I condemn you is for the same reason that virtually all responsible real scientists who publish real information condemns what you are doing and criticizes what you're doing. For now, mainstream science, politicians and public opinion believe that cloning humans would be courting disaster. The reason why you should not be cloning is because it's dangerous, because it's unnecessary and because actually it is damaging our respect for human life and the dignity of human beings, and you should be ashamed of what you are doing. But the momentum towards cloning may be unstoppable. We either do it right, ladies and gentlemen, or we don't do it. And those, incidentally, that wish to ban this technology, and I said this to the US Congress, and I'm going to say that to you tonight, they are not going to be the Neil Armstrongs that would fly, that would fly us to the moon and walk us on it. Therefore, we need to be courageous, we need to move forward, and we need to develop this technology in a safe, responsible fashion, and I think it is the right thing to do, and we intend to do that. Thank you very much.